Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very, very accomplished woman from the United States, Judith Katz. Judith, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. Judith is the owner of the Khalil Jamison Consulting Group. She's an author, and all of you who have heard me so many times know I'm partial to authors. She's the author of two books. Uh, uh, the first one is Safe Enough to Soar, or maybe many books, uh, White Awareness, which is a handbook for anti-racism training. She's also an author of No Fairy Godmothers, No Magic, no Magic Wands, The Healing Process After Rape, uh, which she said is an autobiographical work, and we will talk a little bit about that. And she's been recognized very, very widely for her expertise in diversity and inclusion. So, uh, Judith, let's start our conversation with the Khalil Jamison Consulting Group. Tell me a little bit about this venture. Sure. Happy to. Actually, I am now a um, retired co-owner of the firm. Um, okay. My business partner, Fred Miller, has continued it. The firm was started by a woman whose name was Khalil Jamison. And in mm -hmm. 1970... She started doing workshops on racism and sexism in her church group. Mm -hmm. And somebody in her church group said, come into my company and do this work. Mm -hmm. And he was a Procter and Gamble. Mm -hmm. So the firm started um, again, 1970. She died of breast cancer in 1985. Mm -hmm. And she was working with Fred Miller, who um, uh, took over as CEO. And he decided to keep her name and continue the firm. Okay. So we have been around for 50 years. Um, mm -hmm. We're the oldest, longest term diversity and inclusion organization development change firm wow. um, in the United States. Wow. Yeah. It's been and, a long time. And, and you spent, uh, Judith, a lot, you know, some time in academia and then you moved to consulting. What was uh, the motivation to move? So I was a tenured faculty member um, and I just found that higher ed was too hard to change, mm -hmm. too slow to change, too hard to change. The corporate world, which is where our clients are, was is much more bottom line focused. You know, if they have a, a mission, they can accomplish it. And I actually needed to find a place where I could really accelerate change, which is mm -hmm. one of the things that we were able to. Hmm. Very so, interesting. Yeah. So, uh, Judith, now let's move to DEI. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is a subject that is, I think, in, in, in something being discussed in every country, every boardroom. Uh, let me start by asking you, gender inequality and women empowerment uh, is now being recognized all over the world, but you are an expert here. What are some of the key challenges? Mm, there are many. You know, I think the biases that we've had and the ways in which these are deeply rooted in our cultures and our societies mm. is really hard to change. And mm. therefore, our policies and practices within organizations also reflect those biases, mm. right? So, um, we, and we saw with COVID, how many women have left mm. the workplace because mm. of needing to care for family members, children, et cetera. Mm. So we keep on finding the burden of family being put on women specifically. Mm. Mm. And I think all of the biases we grew up with uh, continue to reflect in the workplace itself. No matter mm -hmm. how much we say we need to change this, no matter how much we make some gains, mm -hmm. it's still not enough. Mm -hmm. It's still not enough. And uh, do you see this kind of, uh, you know, these biases, are, are they pretty uniform across sectors, across states in the US, maybe across the whole world? Or, or is there a, something that impacts um, uh, DEI across different uh, areas? You know, I think the cultural context and the local laws and the history all we show up differently, mm -hmm. but oppression shows up everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can see that globally in terms of what's happening in Ukraine and Russia, right, mm -hmm. in terms of histories, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I've worked all over the globe. I've worked in India. I've worked in Singapore. I've worked in China, you know, mm -hmm. et cetera, uh, as well as the United States and Europe. And we, we see these biases and these efforts everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and Africa as well. I mean, so I don't think that they're, anybody's immune to them. Mm -hmm. They're places where perhaps they do a little better than others, mm -hmm. but we still face the fundamental issues and challenges around mm -hmm. these, around women or other, you know, of other diverse groups that have found themselves 
underrepresented or found themselves oppressed in some way. Very interesting. And uh, what are your views on how this imbalance can be corrected faster? First of all, organizations have to decide that it's important enough to do. Correct. And you know what we've seen in, in the boardroom in the United States is in where, where it's been mandated that says you must have X amount of women or, mm -hmm. or different diversity on the board, it actually mm -hmm. happens. So mm -hmm. we need mandates, we need to make this a priority mm -hmm. and we need to eliminate, to eliminate the structures that mm -hmm. are getting in the way mm -hmm. um, of, of having qualified candidates who don't necessarily rise to the top. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, Judith, based on, you know, whatever I have seen in the world, society, um, and uh, education is a very, very critical mm -hmm. part of inclusiveness. I'd love to get your perspective it, on how can society it, and be made to change? Oh my gosh, you know, we take two steps forward and one step back in our right. societies. Um, I, you know, we see, you know, the waves of feminism or the waves of change. And then all of a sudden what we find is we back up again, right? Because the the status quo gets worried mm -hmm. about, oh my God, we're going to lose our foothold. Mm -hmm. So I think our, but I do think, you know, if you look at the trajectory, when I think about when I first started, mm -hmm. men were still wondering about whether a woman, you know, they could shake a woman's hand. I mm -hmm. mean, men would not shake my hand. They would mm -hmm. not be in a, a room with me alone because yeah. mm -hmm. they were afraid I was going to say that I was harassing them. So mm -hmm. we have seen our society shift, right? We have seen changes being made, mm -hmm. but, and education, education is a part of it in terms of educating people about the need for change, mm -hmm. um, but it's slow, it's slow. And, you know, I, I, again, I would say that we take a few steps forward, we see it mm -hmm. taking steps back, but then again, you know, when I think about my own career, so mm -hmm. I'm in my seventies now, mm -hmm. when I think about my own career, you know, as a woman, there are places where we would never have seen women. Mm. We've never seen women head of, head of you know, uh, inter, inter um, uh, organizational funds or mm. in terms of kind of leadership or head mm. of corporations that we're mm. seeing. So we have seen some change, just mm. not enough, not fast enough. Absolutely. And do you think uh, this whole subject of diversity, equity, inclusion should be included in a part of the school curriculum? And if yes, uh, what are your thoughts on it? So this. This is in the United States. I don't know if you've been following critical race theory challenges mm -hmm. and conversations. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a segment in our society, at least in the U.S., that is mm -hmm. like we don't want to talk about this. We don't want to address this. Is this is a leftist agenda? Versus other places where yes, we should talk about how our children grow up, and we should mm -hmm. talk about our histories, and we should mm -hmm. talk about equality. What what an idea! Equality, right? And freedom. I mean, Correct. we should be able. Our children should understand that we should treat each other in an equal way, that Correct. we should be not having our biases, et cetera. So I would say, from my point of view, it's absolutely essential that we learn these, you know, these values are not bad values. These are values mm. about wholesomeness and about um, human beings on earth, mm. and that we shouldn't be treating somebody different because of how you look or because of status or other things. Mm. And yet there seems to be a concern that, oh, my God, you're going to teach my child that they're going to feel bad. Mm. Um, so we're seeing both the push and pull around this mm. because, uh, you know, LBGTQ conversations we never had in schools. Now right. we're having them because we see the level of suicide and we see the level of impact by not mm. affirming mm. children's identities in terms of whatever they are. So I'm a strong believer that we have to be having these conversations um, mm -hmm. in an age appropriate way. Right. And in a way that people don't feel put down for who they are, mm. but really can extend themselves to others. It's mm. absolutely essential. Mm. Well said. I, and I completely agree. I've often wondered why half the population of the world uh, must be treated any differently from the other half. I mean, you know, it's I just I've never understood that problem. But moving on, Jurith, uh, you know, I've spoken to many people on DEI and there are several, uh, what I would call self-limiting beliefs that seem mm. to exist, um, you know, in this whole discussion. Uh, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on this. Sure. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges is 
when we think about the biases in the society, they also come, we internalize those, mm -hmm. right? We internalize them. We're not as smart. We internalize them as I'm, I shouldn't make more money than my husband. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we internalize all of those. I'm worthless. I mean, the mm -hmm. whole thing about value and, you know, and myself as a woman, I mean, I've with a lot of therapy, mm -hmm. um, having to go through and expunge those beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. and, and how they show up in terms of, you know, am I, am I, do I have value? Do mm -hmm. I have, should I be make, what kind of career can I have? Self-limiting mm -hmm. beliefs about how far can I go? Um, or, you know, that I shouldn't be a, I sh I'm the caretaker, therefore I should be no, you know, taking care of everybody else but myself. Mm. Um, I think there are a lot of ways in which, or not speaking up about salary, you know, somebody will take care of me. Um, years ago, when Fred and I first started working together, I mm. assumed he would just take care of me. Mm -hmm. Instead, I had to speak up for what I thought was right. And I had Correct. to like stand my ground around some things. And for mm. a lot of women, that's very hard. And we've been told not to. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, in many ways, those self-limiting beliefs, I, I call it about we internalize dominance and we internalize oppression. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the one up group, we internalize dominance. This is my space. I should take up a lot of space mm -hmm. versus, you know, I should make myself small, which is what, what a lot of women or people in underrepresented groups do, mm -hmm. you know, that we don't feel entitled to having the things that we have or having the position or having the promotion, mm -hmm. et cetera, or getting the salary we think that we should be getting. So it's, we, we, we show up in ways that actually don't help us, but it's hard because we've internalized mm -hmm. those messages from our society in a very deep way. And we learn them from, you know, when we're little, sure. Sure. <laughs> you know, sure. aren't, aren't you the cute little girl as opposed to you, the smart boy, you know, yeah. there's yeah. so many ways in mm -hmm. which there's, there's one quick study I should touch. I want to just mention, mm -hmm. In, in years ago, there was a study uh, that showed that when teachers were teaching kids, when, when a child wanted something stapled, mm -hmm. if it was a girl, they would staple it for them. If it was a boy, they would say to the boy, here's how you do it. Now you do it. Amazing. And so there's subtle ways in which we reinforce the helplessness or mm -hmm. we reinforce you can do that. Mm. versus giving someone the skill to do that. And it's just, you know, it doesn't take a lot. Correct. We just over and over and over repeat those behaviors that say mm. you're not capable. Mm. So it's really yep. an interesting, fascinating. Absolutely. Thing. You know, there's this example that you've just given me of the stapler. I mean, I think it's, it's so brilliant. Uh, but would you have any other kind of such examples for our viewers and listeners that you may have worked with? where you've seen this incredible oh difference? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. I was thinking about it more from an equity point of view. And when mm -hmm. one of my clients, um, one of the things we found was a woman and man come into the organization. They're both high performers, mm -hmm. both really smart, and they both start at the same salary level in the same position. Mm -hmm. And then what they, what they find is they're both going to be promoted. But you know mm -hmm. what? The guy, they just say, let's give him a stretch assignment. And for the woman, they say, she's just not ready yet. Wow. So he gets the stretch assignment six mm -hmm. months ahead of her. Mm -hmm. She gets a promotion, but it's now it's six months behind in terms of salary, in terms of title, et cetera. And this trajectory keeps on coming and showing up. Mm -hmm. And so even though, even though they may end up with a similar title at the end of their careers, the salary differential mm -hmm. will be quite huge because of bonuses, because of promotions, because of timing on that. Mm -hmm. And so there's ways in which that subtlety, and though if you did an analysis, mm -hmm. you would say, we don't have any bias in our organization. But if you looked at it in a much more in-depth way, that's mm -hmm. where you find the inequities in organizations. Well, and that's sad. just one mm -hmm. of many examples. You know, he gets a stretch. She's just not ready. She has to prove that she can be ready in that position. Mm -hmm. We have different criteria for women and men. And I've seen this over and over and over again in our client systems. Well so said. That's, that's just well said. one example. Mm. My next question to you, uh, Judith, is that there is also a differential uh, being created because of uh, societal, religious, educational uh, beliefs. Uh, love to get your thoughts. <laughs> oh, you know, I grew up... Um, uh, in my religion, I can, I'm Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. And so I can remember my father saying, women don't do this, women don't do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I grew up with lots of self-limiting 
or ex mm. societal limiting religious beliefs that say what my role could be or couldn't mm. be. Mm. And we see this in, in many, many religions, right? Women can't be yep. priests. Women can't be this. I mean, women couldn't be rabbis when I was growing up mm. and now they are. Mm. So, you know, there's many ways in which our, which our religions mm. also hamper us, limit us. Um, and we've had a fight for it within our, within the religious realm as well mm. as societal realm. I mean, these, these fights have not been just in one sphere. They've been mm. in many spheres, corporations, et cetera. Mm. So I would say, uh, you know, religion can be a, an important part of our spiritual life, very important part. Mm. And yet it can also give us messages about who really counts, right? Mm. In the patriarchy, it's, you know, God, men, <laughs> women, maybe children, mm. Mm. and then animals. I mean, we have a whole hierarchy yep. um, within the patriarchy of, of what matters and who matters. Well said. Well yeah, said. I don't want to... So I've got time for one more question and then I want to move to your book. Okay. Uh, based on the, you know, you and I are of the similar vintage. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the younger group of people who are now inheriting the earth, the millennials and the Gen Zs, and they've started to move into mm -hmm. leadership roles in the corporate world. And I'm sure you worked with a lot of young people. I'd love Absolutely. to get your perspective on how are they beginning to change uh, diversity, equity, inclusion? Well, first of all, I think many of them grew up in a much more diverse society. Yep. So had friends who were diff of different backgrounds and identities, and they're also not limiting themselves in, even in identity. Think about gender mm. identity mm. and the whole question about pronouns and, and what's going on. So we've seen a shift. Mm. even in identity. I look at my granddaughter, who's 22. I mean, mm. she doesn't have all the same tropes that I grew up with in many ways, right? Correct. So I think that they're coming into organizations and trying to change um, formality and um, the, the, the rules and mm. address these issues. But, you know, just like boomers tried to do that, yep. there's something that happens when you get in a corporate sector mm. that also changes you. So the big question will be, will these, will they succeed in moving the organization forward? I think COVID has also disrupted mm -hmm. in many ways, the mm -hmm. whole question about remote work, et cetera, and hybrid and, mm -hmm. you know, people choosing the great resignation that we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that will shift things dramatically because people no longer feel like they have no choice right. to stay, that they have to stay in a, in a workplace. I think mm -hmm. the good news is, is that people are saying, if you don't treat me right, I'm not staying. Mm. You know, I don't have to tolerate bad behavior. Mm. And I think that's giving, that creates that possibility for significant change in organizations. Mm. Mm. But, you know, that's still a question. You know, will, will the jury's still out? I'm hoping for them. I'm, I really hope that they can make the changes that we I, need to make. And make I hope so as well. I hope so as well. So, Judith, let me move to uh, your book, uh, which is No Fairy uh, God Grandmothers. Um, godmothers. Godmothers. godmothers no fairy godmothers <laughs> no magic wands the healing process after rape tell you wrote this book in 1984 when the subject was discussed in very very harsh tones tell me a little bit about this book and what made you write it sure so you know i consider myself a feminist um i had when i was in graduate school many friends who Rape was not an issue that we didn't talk about. In fact, I had a very close friend who had been raped. And yeah. I thought that I had been very supportive of her. When I moved to Oklahoma, which is where I taught for the first mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. um, I was, somebody broke into my house and, and I was raped. Mm -hmm. And I felt like and this was 1976 when that mm -hmm. happened. Um, and I felt a very strong responsibility to speak up about it. Mm -hmm. because it felt like, again, hushed tones. We didn't mm -hmm. talk about it. And, mm -hmm. and I had talk about internalization of messages. You know, I knew I wasn't responsible. I knew that it wasn't my fault. And yet I felt all those things. Correct. And so one thing is the intellectual of what we know mm -hmm. as a feminist, as in terms of, you know, the whole experience around sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And then it was the experience that I was having. And you know, the things that helped me were talking to my friends, the things mm. that helped me was speaking out about it, the things that helped me was, you know, really confronting my own internalization of it. And mm. I felt important to write this book. And um, so I'm glad I did. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was on TV at the time, even in Oklahoma, yeah. on some talk shows to address these issues, and clearly at the university. 
Mm. And there was a wonderful group of people that surrounded me and supported me mm. through that process. Mm. Um, but I felt like it was like, if I'm going through this and it's so hard for me, what about people who mm. didn't have the kind of, you know, support systems or rhetoric, et cetera, that I Correct. did. So, very interesting. Yeah. And, and the, no, the title was, no, there are no fairy godmothers. Nobody's coming to give you a magic Correct. wand and take all the pain away, yeah. right? And to really understand going from a, of a, of a victim to a survivor mm. and thriver was so important because it's how do you use that experience to mm. really see the courage that you had and the abilities to overcome it mm. and integrate it into yeah. your life in a meaningful way. Well said, well said. So uh, I've got time for one more question. And I think uh, I want to mm. talk to you about uh, your other books. Uh, tell me about your other books and maybe uh, a little more detail about any one of the other books. Sure. So my first book was White Awareness, Handbook for Anti-Racism Training. Mm -hmm. It was really one of, that was 1978. It was one of the first system, systemic books around dealing with institutional, cultural, and individual racism. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of that. It's still impressed today. Mm -hmm. But Fast forward, um, Fred Miller and I have written another four or five books together. Mm -hmm. um, the first on inclusion was called Inclusion Breakthrough, Unleashing the Real Power of Diversity. And that was in mm -hmm. 2002. And we were one of the first to really coin the term of inclusion. Because mm -hmm. the question was, if we didn't have racism, if we didn't have sexism, what would we have? Correct. And we were trying to find something that was the alternative, which was an inclusive society. Now, I mm -hmm. think the words have been overused. We still need to find some words that really speak to what this society, this mm -hmm. really looks like, or this organization. We also wrote um, a book called Be Big, Step Up, mm -hmm. Step Out, Be Bold, mm -hmm. which was about this whole thing about internalized messages, mm -hmm. right? How do I show up big? How do I see you as big? How do I get rid of those biases? Mm -hmm. And how do I create teams that are big? And the next book we wrote was called um, Opening Doors to Teamwork and Collaboration, Four mm -hmm. Keys That Change Everything. So what are the behaviors mm -hmm. that really help us with inclusion? And lastly, most recently, we wrote a book called Safe Enough to Soar, um, which is about inc increasing trust, inclusion, and um, uh, a partnership in the workplace, which is really about how do you create psychological safety? Because mm. it's if we don't have psychological safety, none of the other stuff can flow. Mm. So Fred and I keep writing these books. We're working on another one soon. Um, but uh, and they've been used by our clients, and they um, be big has sold like a hundred thousand copies. You know, wow. so we're really proud of the Amazing. fact that we have some reach yeah. with that. Fantastic! Yeah. Fantastic! Yeah. Amazing. So Judith, on that note. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you for talking to me about your amazing journey uh, in diversity, equity, inclusion as a DEI expert or DEI guru. Thank you for being an activist and doing so much for, as I mentioned, 50% of the world. And I do hope and pray that we will reach a situation sooner than later when there will be complete equality, which is absolutely logical and uh, must happen. Thank you also for speaking to me about uh, your books uh, and also a little more in detail about uh, your book, No Fairy Godmothers. Thank you again, Judith, and good luck. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Brand Called You videocast and podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.